Does the federal government have lawful authority to make any restrictions on our guns and ammunition? No. no. Most people assume that they do, since that's what the federal government has been doing. But they don't have lawful authority. I'll show you. Let's look first at when the federal government started restricting firearms. It was in 1927 when Congress banned the mailing of certain weapons. We went from 1776 to 1927, 150 years after our founding, when Congress decided we better start disarming the American people. Remember, the progressives had taken over the federal government by this time. In 1934, the federal government started regulating gangster weapons. In 1938, Congress told gun dealers they had to get a federal firearms license and maintain records of the names and addresses of persons who bought firearms. Restrictions on gun ownership have increased, and we now have a president and powerful political forces who want to disarm us entirely. So what are we going to do about it? Are we going to beg for crumbs and ask them to please let us keep some of our weapons if we get a license and pass their background check? Some of you may have seen the letter from the Utah Sheriff's Association. It is shameful because it begs Obama to let Congress decide what regulations to impose and don't do it by executive order, please, Mr. President. But we must make a principled resistance. To do that, we must learn the applicable principle. So let's see what our Constitution says about whether the federal government has lawful authority to impose gun control. Now here is an interesting but little known fact about our Constitution. It is one of enumerated powers only. When we, the people, ordained and established the Constitution, we created the federal government. It is our creature. We are the creator. It is the creature. It is not our master. We listed, itemized, enumerated every single power we delegated to the federal government. That's why the Constitution is so short. <laughs> Depending upon how you count, we delegated only 21 powers to the federal government. The powers we delegated to Congress over the country at large are listed primarily at Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 1 through 16. So where in the Constitution did we, the people, delegate to our creature authority to restrict Nowhere. We never gave the federal government that authority. It becomes so simple, easy, and clear when you just look to the Constitution. So, all laws made by Congress, all rules of the Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms, and Tobacco, any and all executive orders which purport to restrict firearms, and any and all Supreme Court opinions which purport to restrict firearms are all unconstitutional as outside the scope of the powers we delegated to our creature in this Constitution. Now let's talk about the right of self-defense. Our natural right to defend ourselves, our families, and our communities from attack is as old as human history. The Declaration of Independence at the second paragraph says our rights come from God. God. And it is God who gave us the right to defend ourselves with lethal force if necessary. The Second Amendment is not the source of our right. It, is merely, it merely recognizes that the right is to be free from any interference whatsoever by the federal government. What is it about the word infringe that we do not understand? Our framers were all for an armed American people. They understood that arms are our ultimate defense in the event the federal government oversteps its bounds. 
James Madison, father of our Constitution, writes in the second half of Federalist Paper number 46 that the reason the citizens, that's the militia, are armed is to defend ourselves, our families, communities, and states in the event the federal government ignores the Constitution limits on its delegated powers and turns into a tyranny. Now let's look at the early days of our republic. Our framers thought a heavily armed citizenry was a wonderful idea. I'll give three examples proving this. The militia fought in our war for independence. In the movie Patriot, Mel Gibson's character commanded a South Carolina militia. These were civilians who took up arms against the British. Everyone knew that the militia was the armed citizens, farmers, shopkeepers, blacksmiths, clergy. The militia still is the citizens. Two, do you know what a letter of mark and reprisal is? Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11 authorizes Congress to grant letters of mark and reprisal. That clause permits Congress to authorize privately owned armed ships to make war on our enemies. During the depredations of the Barbary pirates during the administration of Thomas Jefferson, Congress issued a letter of mark and reprisal authorizing a privately owned armed ship to go make war on the Barbary pirates. In the War of 1812, when the British attacked us, Congress issued letters of mark and reprisal authorizing privately owned armed ships, privateers, to attack British ships. These privateer ships were as heavily armed as the ships of our own Navy. Our framers had no problem with we, the people, being as heavily armed as our regular military. That is because they did not see themselves as our rulers. Now let's see where the Constitution granted authority to Congress to require all able-bodied adult male citizens to get armed. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16. Pursuant to that clause, in 1792, Congress passed the Militia Act of 1792. This act required all able-bodied male citizens, except, of course, for federal officers and employees, between the ages of 18 and under 45, to buy a rifle, ammunition, and report for training in their local militia. As Section 1 of the Militia Act of 1792 shows, the militia is the civilian citizens. So our framers thought it such a fine idea that the American people be armed that they required it by law. And they contemplated an American people who were so heavily armed that they could be privateers and wreak vengeance on our enemies under letters of mark and reprisal. That is the Constitution our framers gave us. That is the Constitution we still have. Now we must invoke it. There are ominous signs all around us. Why are Obama and his henchmen trying to disarm us? What was the leading cause of unnatural death in the 20th century? Governments murdering their own people, democide. Soviet Russia, Nazi Germany, Communist China, Cuba, Cambodia, North Korea, all over the world, communist and fascist and Islamic dictatorships murder their own peoples by the tens of millions. And do not think that that isn't coming this way. Obama's buddy Bill Ayers sat around with his weather underground cohorts planning how to kill 25 million Americans, and I'm sure the number is much higher now. 
But before they round us up and take us away to the extermination camps, they must disarm us. That is what is going on. Ann Coulter pointed out recently that universal registration leads to confiscation, and confiscation leads to extermination. It always has. Why do you think they are so hell-bent on disarming us? If the federal government has slingshots, all we need is slingshots. If the federal government has muskets, all we need is muskets. But if the federal government has fully automatic weapons and hollow points, and all we have is muskets, we will be murdered by the tens of millions. To those who believe that the federal government should have a monopoly on force, read the second half of Federalist Paper number 46 written by James Madison, father of our Constitution. The purpose of armed citizens is to fight the federal government if the need arises. So let us have no more talk of reasonable restrictions and background checks imposed by the federal government. When you fight the dragon, are you going to cut off its head or are you going to beg permission to trim its claws? When you are drawing the line in the sand, where are you going to draw it? Are you going to agree to some infringements by the federal government? Or will you draw the line at the Constitution which says the federal government may not impose any restrictions? We should be nullifying, ignoring all federal laws and rules restricting guns and ammunition. Ignore them. We must cut the head off the dragon and cut and draw the line at the Constitution. Now, this is a charming essay, The Coming Day of Burn Barrels and Blessings. Um, it was posted on survivalblog.com by James Wesley Rawls. Now, he is a manly man. He proposes we set aside a day where all the gun dealers bring their records of firearm sales, their federal firearms licenses, their ATF rule books, and all other such unconstitutional stuff to their local town square where burn barrels will be set up and they will burn it all. Rawls plans to wear a Guy Fawkes mask the movie V for Vendetta tells you all about Guy Fawkes and suggests that everyone else wear a mask also. On the same day, the dealers will wipe their computers clean of all such records, claiming, if asked, that they were forced to do so by masked men carrying guns. <laughs> And remember, the federal government has no lawful authority to make any restrictions or infringements throughout the country on our right to keep and bear arms. Now I have a few words for all state and county officers about their oaths of office. Article 6, Clause 3 of the Federal Constitution and Article 1, Section 4 of the Tennessee Constitution require every official in this state to support the Federal Constitution. When you acquiesce in unconstitutional acts of the federal government, you are not supporting the Constitution. You are conniving with tyrants against your own people. And if you connive with tyrants against your own people so that you can keep your federal funding, then shame on you for becoming so corrupt that you allow yourself to be bribed with money that your grandchildren will have to pay back. And if you connive with tyrants against your own people because you are too cowardly to stand up to them, then you need to resign your office and let a manly man or a womanly woman do the job you are too chicken to do. Our Declaration of Independence recites how our, and this makes me weep, how our forefathers opposed with manly firmness. King George's invasions on the rights of the people. 
But yesterday at the hearing on Senator May Beaver's bill, three members of the Senate Judiciary Committee showed that they lack the manly firmness to impose to oppose federal invasions on our God-given rights to self-defense. Yes. Who are they? Tell us who they are. Um, Brian Overby. Kelsey, Overby, and uh, Finney. Who else? <laughs> Now a few words about the Tennessee Constitution and a state militia. When in 1870 the present Constitution for the state of Tennessee was ratified, the people of Tennessee contemplated an armed citizenry. Article 8 of the Tennessee Constitution authorizes a state militia. Our state legislature may lawfully do the same thing for our state that Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16 authorizes Congress to do for the country at large. We can form a state militia, require all able-bodied male citizens to join. We may exempt males who are members of pacifist churches. And we may provide that any other able-bodied male citizen who doesn't want to show up for musters and training must pay a fine. Yes. Article 1, Section 28 of the Tennessee Constitution says that no citizen of this state shall be compelled to bear arms provided he will pay an equivalent to be ascertained by law. This shows that the people of Tennessee once understood the importance of having all able-bodied male citizens, except for federal officers and employees, you don't want them in your militia, armed. <laughs> Anyone who was not willing to take up arms in defense of this state could be fined. Yet Senators Kelsey, Overby, and Finney on the Senate Judiciary Committee aren't willing to lift a finger to prevent the federal government from disarming us entirely. What we need is some of that manly firmness Thomas Jefferson wrote about in the Declaration of Independence. And now I have a dire warning about the Second Amendment. Our misplaced focus on the Second Amendment as being the source of our right to keep and bear arms is a looming disaster. I'll show you how judges on the Supreme Court look at this. Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1 gives federal courts judicial power over all cases arising under this Constitution. The Second Amendment is part of the Constitution. Therefore, federal judges have judicial power over the Second Amendment. That means, in their minds, that they have the power to determine what the Second Amendment means, that they have the power to determine the scope and extent of the right. That's what they believe. In D.C. v. Heller, which was decided in 2008 by the Supreme Court, five judges on the Supreme Court said the Second Amendment gives us an individual right to keep and bear arms unconnected with service in the militia. But four judges said it didn't give us that right. Now here's the warning. If Scalia, Thomas, Alito, or Kennedy die, and Obama points the replacement, you will have five judges on that court saying the Second Amendment does not give individuals the right to keep and bear arms. That is why we must stop babbling about our Second Amendment rights, because we are one Supreme Court justice away from having our precious Second Amendment right taken away from us forever. The letter from the Utah Sheriff's Association regurgitates the ignorant babble about how the Second Amendment is what gives us the right to bear arms. Well, just wait until Obama or Hillary replaces one of our four remaining judges on that court. 
So we better start pointing to the Declaration of Independence, second paragraph, and insist that our right to keep and bear arms to self-defense comes from Almighty God and is unalienable, and no black-robed human can touch it. And now a few words about the very high status of the county sheriff. Your office is provided for in the Tennessee Constitution. You are elected by the citizens of your county. You take an oath to support the federal constitution and the Tennessee Constitution. You are the highest law enforcement official in your county. I haven't read Sheriff Mack's book, The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope, but I have watched with delight, as I think you will too, a series of five short videos where Sheriff Mack explains the powers and duties of the county sheriff. You can find the videos if you Google Sheriff Mack, the power of the county sheriff. The federal government has no lawful authority to restrict our arms. We didn't delegate that power to the federal government in the federal constitution. <coughs> The Tennessee Constitution contemplates an armed citizenry, the state militia with its mandatory membership. Since the sheriffs swore to support our federal and state constitutions, then you must not permit federal authorities to come into your county and disarm your people. If If our lace panty wearing Tennessee state legislators <laughs> refuse, refuse to stand up with manly firmness to the lawless acts of the federal government as they attempt to disarm us, then our sheriffs really are our last hope. But you are not alone. You have the specific statutory authority, <laughs> section 38-3-102, to form your own posse with as many men in your county as you think proper. Sheriff Mack said he had 125,000 armed men in his posse. This, this is how you defend your people in your county in the event the federal government invades your county and attempts to disarm your people. In closing, a warning about the despair business of federalizing the county sheriffs and the Tennessee State Highway Patrol. When Obama ran for office, he said he wanted a civilian national security force, which is, quote, just as powerful, just as strong, just as well-funded as the military, end quote. Why does he want a civilian national security force? I'll show you. Congress holds the power over our military. Pursuant to Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 11 through 16, Congress is the one who declares war, determines the funding, and makes the rules for the governance of the military. Under the Constitution, the President is merely the Commander-in-Chief. The Federalist Papers say that Commander-in-Chief is merely the top general. Congress controls our armed military. Obama wants a powerful armed force over which he has total and exclusive control. The Department of Homeland Security is an executive agency under his control, and that is the vehicle he is using to federalize state and county law enforcement by putting them under the control of Homeland Security. Now, in 2004, the Tennessee State Legislature passed Section 38-3-114, which effectively puts the county sheriffs, you, under the control of the Department of Homeland Security. I don't know if they're enforcing it now, but it is in place for them to enforce when the time is ripe for them. 
This is the department which, pun which published the memo saying that veterans, Bible reading Christians, people who talk about the Constitution, people who oppose abortion, and people who support gun rights are dangerous to the federal government. We need to we need to get section 383114 and the parallel provision for the state highway patrol repealed this session and if our panty waste legislators don't repeal it then just ignore the damn thing <laughs> don't take any money from the federal government you don't need federal money to arm your posse the members of your posse as manly men should arm themselves thank you, thank you.